Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for today's presentation as part of the Industry Insight webinar series. The topic this time is five strategies for building the law firm of the future. Speaking today will be Jared Correa. The Industry Insight webinar series is hosted by the ABA Legal Technology Resource Center. To stay updated on upcoming webinars or view previous videos, visit ambar.org slash industry insight. You can also stay updated on legal technology news through our blog, www.lawtechnologytoday.org. Jared is the Assistant Director and Senior Law Practice Advisor at LOMAP. Before joining LOMAP, Jared managed CLE Publications and the Case Maker Research Engine for the Massachusetts Bar Association. He also has been a practicing lawyer in small firms where he mostly focused on personal injury, real estate, and disability law. Jared is a frequent speaker for local, regional, and national lawyers groups. Thank you all for joining us today, and we'll now begin the webinar. Thanks, Rose. I appreciate it. You got through a lot there. I'm impressed. Um, and thanks to uh, Legal Technology Resource Center, the ABA, and Abacus Law for having me present this program. It's my pleasure. It looks like we got a bunch of people online, so I'm just going to get right into it. Um, I actually wanted to call this five strategies for building the law firm of the near future, but Rose told me not to do that. So um, what I want to focus on is sort of what are five things you can do now to future-proof your law firm? for 2015 through 2020, let's say. I'm not a fan of the term future proofing, but what I'll try to do through this webinar is to alert you to some trends in the industry and let you know how you might be able to take advantage of those. So as you can see, um, I really like Back to the Future. It's like my, one of my favorite movies. Um, so that's going to be our theme for today. Um, don't tell Robert Zemeckis, if you know him, that I've been co-opting a lot of his intellectual property. Um, this is probably my favorite line from the movie where Doc Brown comes out and uh, says, uh, we're going back to the future, but um, the car's going to be flying, so where we're going, we don't need roads. I do a pretty good impression of that when I'm in the mood. Um, but so we're going to talk about near future issues for law firms and we're focused on 2015 right now which is interesting because that's the year Back to the Future 2 took place. So watch for some of the images I pulled here and uh, see if you can figure out what part of the movie I'm, uh, I'm referencing. So the future perfect tense I think is sort of a, uh, a forgotten tense in grammar um, and this idea of future perfect is sort of interesting in the legal field. So how do you build the perfect law firm uh, of the future? I think a lot of people have tried to answer that question in a lot of different ways. But there are some limits on that predictive power. So I think most of the legal futurists out there are looking to predict what's happening in the legal field in the next 20 to 30 years, let's say, 10 to 20 to 30 years. Um, we're talking about robots taking over law firms. Um, but there's a lot that you can do in the near term, and much of that is easier to predict. So when I talk about the future of law practice in the context of this webinar, I'm talking about the near future of law practice. So that sweet spot of 2015 to 2020. What trends are happening now in the legal practice that most lawyers are not taking advantage of, but that you could to gain a competitive advantage? And really what this is all about, that's what this is all about. I mean what reason would we have to predict the future unless we were looking to try to achieve a, pre a competitive advantage by doing so. So most of this is going to be a sort of 30,000 foot overview. We've only got a half an hour, which I think is a great time period for a webinar, but if I'm going to talk about five big strategy arcs, which I intend to do, we're going to be addressing this in a very broad way just to give you some new ideas about how to think about your practice or how to think about some ideas you've already had in potentially a different way. As Rose said, there will be time for Q&A after. This program will be up at the Law Technology Today blog and there will be different ways to access this. So questions arise, um, people want to send me emails um, or have other suggestions and perhaps I can spin some of these topics out in greater detail. Let's talk about collaborative technology. Collaborative technology, I think, is it's changing in a very significant way. Lawyers, as you probably know, being lawyers, are very comfortable working in Microsoft Office, Outlook email in particular, 
lawyers love email. Um, and it's not just lawyers. Many business people love email. And it's hard to get out of that uh, because email is very satisfying to people, right? You get an email, uh, you reply to it, you're done with it, kind of. Um, the thing is, though, that people are starting to communicate and to collaborate in different and broader ways. And lawyers may not be in touch with those trends as well as other uh, business people are. There's been this notion that lawyers are uh, resistant to technology or disinterested in technology. Um, I think that's true for some attorneys, but I think for most lawyers, the issue is that the options are just overwhelming. How do you choose a technology that is useful for your practice and has specific uh, uses that work within your business processes? Um, the other piece of this is that in addition to finding the technology you want to use, um, it's hard to be able to uh, find the time to make that a vetted choice. So it's a matter of finding the right technology options and then vetting those options to see what works in your particular environment. But most lawyers are going to default to what they've already done. They're going to default to Microsoft to Outlook for communication, and that can get clunky from time to time. Um, many lawyers are uh, using chat to communicate with their staff because it's a quicker, more effective way to get things done. Um, it's less obtrusive uh, than email in some ways. Um, and there are products out there that provide um, basically a stream, sort of a Facebook si style stream. Slack is a company I can think of that offers a product like this, where you can share information and ideas and you can collaborate on projects in a different way. Um, project management is probably the better way to look at managing tasks in the law firm. Uh, and most people default to email management of those tasks and projects, but there are different ways to do it. And there's going to be a way that works for you and potentially a way that works for you within a system you already use or by upgrading a system that you've been available, that you've been using. Uh, law practice management software, for example, is one way that people can communicate and collaborate in a different way than they have been traditionally doing. So people, I think, are moving away from email and thinking about different ways to communicate, both within the office and with clients. Now, the other piece of this is that data is becoming more and more important to law firms, more important than it's ever been before. And at this point, um, the internal data that a firm has to keep uh, is big enough data to become problematic. Like, you've got a lot of information that you maintain for your clients and that's related to your clients, and the question is, what do you do with that information? Well, for lawyers, oftentimes that data breaks down into documents. So if you can take specifically that document management portion of what you do out of email, um, it's going to be much more effective for you. Swapping information on a document via email, making edits via email is a tremendously convoluted procedure. Everybody hates doing edits via email attachment. And many programs, not just solely document management products, but other products, including law practice management software products, as I just mentioned, include document management features available. You can upload documents. You can manage and edit documents in a, in a secure space. You can build documents out of templates. And you can do this working with clients, by the way, in a more uh, collaborative environment than email allows for. So if you're using a case management system plus a document management system, you can collaborate with documents in real time potentially with your clients, where you can make edits in an easier, more streamlined fashion than you could by passing email attachments back and forth. If you can think of the different ways that you can communicate with clients effectively, if you can think about the different ways that you can create drafts and documents with clients and colleagues more effectively, you're going to increase the efficiency with your firm, and you're also going to increase happiness on the part of clients and uh, your employees as well. So I think one of the big challenges for lawyers uh, in the next five years is going to be what collaborative environments are they going to use, and how can they start thinking outside the box and moving outside the box in this subject matter. If clients want to work with you in a certain fashion, you're going to be able to accommodate that. If uh, new employees are going to be used to a certain way of working, are you going to try to accommodate that in some fashion, or 
are you going to force them to do things the way you've always done them? What I tell a lot of law firms to do is talk to your clients, talk to your staff about how they want to collaborate and see if there are tools that can effectuate that that work for everybody. Particularly on the client side, if you're going to be collaborating with clients in a way that's easy for them to manage, in a way that's um, useful for them, and, and in a way that uh, provides features that are relevant to them as far as updating documents and information um, and uh, automating that where you can, then I think you're going to create a, uh, an environment where your clients are very happy with what you're providing and then they'll feel like they're part of a system rather than being forced into a system. And the same thing will happen uh, with the attorneys you work with, both colleagues and employees. But the question is always how you can be more efficient, right? So until we, until we have uh, Miller High Life fueling our automobiles, I suppose we have to focus on our law practices. So Uber efficiency, I think, is going to be a hallmark of sort of the new firm, the firms that uh, are going to be successful in the next, say, five-year period on a back-end level. It's easier than ever before to schedule yourself. That, that scheduling has sort of become ubiquitous. Everybody's got a laptop, uh, but now everybody's got a tablet and a smartphone. And if you don't sync those items, if you're not using a single associated calendar that's accessible across all those devices, it's going to be difficult for you to keep track of yourself, and it's also going to be difficult for the people you work with to keep track of where you are and what you're doing. So one of the ways you can be efficient is if you're in court, you can schedule on your smartphone with the same calendar that you would use when you're sitting at your desk in your office. That's easy enough to put together. Um, Creating integrations between software, um, allowing for software, different softwares to coexist within uh, within uh, unique platforms. For example, there are remote desktop options out there, where for a product you've got a email and office suite system and a case management system and a document management system, and it's all managed by one provider, and that provider is uh, sort of managing the sync behind the scenes for you. Those products are out there. They're helpful. Um, you can do it on your own, but it's sometimes easier to automate that. But the trick is you want to have basically one calendar, one information repository that everybody has access to and that everybody's making a point to update regularly. Mobility is also clearly important for the modern lawyer. Um, you're going to be out of the office more often, potentially. Uh, if you've got family obligations, you, you may need to take time to spend with your kids, but you may not make it back to the office in an afternoon. Let's say maybe some kid is sick and has got a doctor appointment. Well, uh, what are you going to do when they're getting checked out? Uh, what are you going to do if you have to be home one afternoon? Well, if you use cloud products, if you uh, have the ability to work in the same environment, on different, different devices, that's tremendously helpful. If you can access your email or your documents wherever you are, then that's going to be useful for you. Um, this notion of sort of working nine to five is becoming, or has become, antiquated. And beyond that, this notion of working in one particular space has become antiquated. The modern lawyer is going to work wherever they are. And there are tools that can allow you to get that done. It's just a matter of finding the right array for you. Additionally, from a process management standpoint, you want to think about workflow as well. So yeah, you create tasks within your calendar and you have an idea of what you're doing, but from a workflow standpoint, you want to make sure that those rote sort of tasks that you do, those things that you do over and over again, you can sort of, um, sort of uh, um, template that. So if you've got a divorce case, let's say, and Every time you do the same 10 things on that divorce case, yeah, sure, you do other stuff, but every time you do 10 things, well, you can automate that process. Instead of creating different tasks as they come up, instead of trying to manage that project differently every time, even though it comes out the same way, create a template. Define a workflow, a series of tasks, and add it to a file right at the outset. Apply some project management and time management techniques to what you do. If you can create workflows within your practice so that you're automating the thought process of checklists, you'll be able to spend some more time on the substantive work that you do, what lawyers are really paid to do. Additionally, if you have staff, if you can delegate tasks appropriately, that's also tremendously useful. 
So it's a matter of keeping yourself in line, but if you have staff and colleagues that you're working with, it's sort of a matter of figuring out what everybody does, and a lot of attorneys don't think of this. Um, what do you uh, do that is uniquely lawyer work, and what can you pass on to an administrative assistant or a paralegal that is uniquely paralegal work? If you can delegate appropriately, you can focus on the substantive work that you're getting paid for. If you do that in the context of a workflow or a task management system, then all, all the better. What you want to do is sort of winnow down to this creative process. Um, many people don't think necessarily of lawyers as creative people, but I think that's incorrect. Um, some of the most creative people in history have been lawyers. Um, it's just a matter of uh, the legal uh, work is a lot of it is forms-based work. But lawyers are paid essentially to be creative problem solvers, not to do administrative work. So if you can farm out that administrative work and do the job of being a creative problem solver, then your clients are going to appreciate that and your business is going to grow. So let's talk a little bit about modern marketing. Modern marketing is more personalized than it has ever been before. And it used to be that you could publish information, and that information was just out there in the ether. And there wasn't this expectation that people might contact you back or have a discussion with you on a platform that was not just a verbal, um, in-person conversation. So when you're marketing as a modern lawyer, you have to think about engagement and not just publication. If you're a personal injury attorney, it's not enough to say, oh, there was a horrific crash on I-97 today. Here are the details. And by the way, I can represent you if you're in a similarly horrific crash. Um, you want to sort of engage with your clients, your potential clients, I should say, not just blast information at them. So you want to be able to connect online in a more personalized way than lawyers have done in the past. And one of the reasons why this is particularly helpful, especially for new firms, is um, firms that have been around for a while, they've already got their marketing plan set out, they've already got their clients coming in, so they're not focused on this. This is something you can focus on, it's a different new stream, and some place where you can uh, figure out where your potential clients are going to come from and how to reach them more effectively. So expect to have uh, interactive, uh, interactive engagements with clients. Um, potentially prior to having them come in to meet with you. If you have an intake form on your, on your website, somebody's going to fill that out. They're going to send information to you. How do you manage that conversation before you have an attorney-client relationship in place? There are ethics uh, issues to worry about here, of course, like when that relationship um, forms, what kind of disclaimers you need. Um, but essentially, you want to do more personalized marketing than you've done before. And part of this is establishing a voice. So what is your niche, both generally and specifically? So what practice areas do you focus on? And how are you different from other practitioners in those areas? Um, you can inject personality into what you do, even as a lawyer, and I think that's tremendously helpful. And I think the more personalized your marketing, the fewer cliches you use, the more people, um, especially modern consumers who have a lot of choices, are going to be willing to engage with you. And that's really what you're looking for. How many law firms have websites where there is a shelf of legal books? How many law firms are tenacious? You want to speak about your practice in a different way. And what this really comes down to is how lawyers, uh, how clients find lawyers nowadays. Clients are, if they've been referred to you, they're going to be searching for your name online. So you need to have an effective, um, effective coverage of that vanity search for your name. But more often than not, you want those clients who have not heard of you. They have a specific issue. So remember I talked about you becoming this creative problem solver. Well, you got to think about how clients are going to be Googling for, your, for the type of work that you do. If you're an estate planning attorney, um, my father needs a will, um, Los Angeles, California lawyer. Are you going to be found in a search like that? If there's a specific question about a particular type of trust, are you going to be found in a search like that? So you want to think about the questions that your clients are going to be asking. And you want to think about how you can answer those questions. Most people do that via a blog, but there are different ways to do that. If you can make that happen, your marketing becomes personal to the people you're reaching out to. 
even if you've never actually had a conversation with them. You are the problem solver, the person who can figure out what their pain point is and how to get around it, and you can connect with people on that level solely uh, through a web search if you put out the right content initially. So I think in all in your marketing interactions as you move forward in, in the next five years of practice, the more personalized you can get, the better, to the extent that you can, given uh, some of the limitations included in the ethics rules. New service delivery models are available for lawyers as well. It used to be that you'd get your client, you'd sign them to a fairly broad fee agreement, and then go from there. There's been a movement uh, mostly through the court systems initially uh, related to limited scope representation. So providing sort of boxed representation. I will do X in the context of this litigation, let's say, and then uh, we will figure out the rest from there. I will do A and B, and if we want to do C, we can have a new or revised agreement. As I said, most of that takes place in the context of the court system, but it doesn't necessarily have to. Attorneys can reduce their practice to specific niches. They can reduce those niches to specific types of um, specific types of, uh, of issues. And further, they can reduce that to basically a task list. So what are the five things I would do in the context of this larger representation? And do I want to do all five of these things for my clients? Maybe I want to do thing one, two, and three for one client, but I only want to do one and two for another client. Well, if you break out your representation in that way, you can create these limited scope um, engagements with your clients and work in that fashion. Um, that's appealing to clients because it's more focused um, and because the price can be reduced if you're doing smaller packages. So it depends on the practice area. It depends on how you want to break these uh, options out, but there are alternative ways to package legal services for clients and to establish fees for those services. Despite the fact that people have said for a while now that the hourly uh, billing is going away, that hasn't really been the case. Most attorneys still bill on an hourly basis because they don't know how to do it otherwise. The movement should be to value billing. So what is it worth again within the contract, constructs of the ethics rules you're in your local jurisdiction, what is it worth to a potential client that you do X work? And that may be higher for some attorneys than others based on experience uh, generally and also with respect to the type of work that we're talking about. But beyond just the standard hourly bill, there are different ways to structure your fee that may or may not be appealing to clients. Clients like price certainty and um, lawyers can make that work. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a testing ground to start with uh, because if you haven't done it before, you may have to try it out before um, you're actually able to find the real value for you and for your client because you ultimately want it to be a two-way street so you have good relationships with your clients. But if you can develop alternative fees, even if it's a simple flat fee, um, if you can take retainers via credit card, those are all appealing things to clients. So if you can focus on service delivery models that are unique, that are different from what other attorneys are doing. And if you can limit your fees and still make money doing that, then that's obviously the holy grail. There are also different ways that you can um, advertise online and potentially work with certain branded networks. And I'll explain what those are momentarily. So Avo, for example, now has a or has had a Q&A site where attorneys can come on and answer questions of potential uh, clients. Now, that's the kind of interaction we're probably going to see moving forward and the, the uh, ethics organizations haven't really quite figured out what to do with that yet. Um, it's unknown whether disclaimers are going to be enough in those cases, but um, that's another way to potentially reach out to uh, clients or potential clients that had not existed previously. So this is, this is a very broad subject, but let me briefly touch on this idea of a branded network. And I'll, I'll give you what I think is a good definition of it from uh, Stephanie Kimbrough, who wrote a book on consumer uh, law recently for the ABA. 
So Branded Network is a company that's created a single brand around their products and services which are marketed directly to consumers. In the case of legal services, these branded networks are providing legal forms and documents through document automation and assembly programs and various other delivery methods. These branded networks invite lawyers to join them in order to provide consumers with access to uh, licensed lawyers and to generate content for the company's website. So you know what I'm talking about, Avo, Q&A site I talked about. Avo's got a new thing where they're, uh, uh, where they're attaching lawyers uh, to clients more directly. It's not necessarily a legal matching service, but that's kind of what it's based on. Um, LegalZoom, Rocket Lawyer, if you think about it, Thompson West, LexisNexis, those are branded networks as well. So one of the issues that lawyers are going to come up against is it's more and more difficult to make money as a solo attorney or a small firm attorney particularly. So what do you do? Uh, how can you broaden your network? How can you broaden your market? And one potential option is to work with a branded network to do that. Not exclusively, necessarily, but to supplement what you do in practice. Um, so the question is, do you work with them, A, and to what extent do you work with them? Um, there's a good article by a colleague of mine, Susan cartier Liebel uh, at Solo Practice University on this very subject where she lists uh, some questions you should ask yourself before you consider working for a uh, branded network or working with a branded network. But there's something to consider on this uh, service delivery model tip. Um, from an ethics standpoint, as we discussed briefly, part, part of the question here is what is attorney advertising and what is not? Uh, what disclaimers are affected? are effective, I should say. When does an attorney-client relationship form and how can you uh, advise uh, potential clients that they are not necessarily in an attorney-client relationship with you? Um, I don't think those questions have necessarily clear answers at this point and one of the reasons people sort of avoid this stuff is there are gray areas that still involved here but there are new service delivery models coming and if you don't embrace them now I think that's perfectly fine but you want to be ready um, if there's a point where you feel that you need to. So last topic I'll address is uh, in the last few minutes here is an ancillary business. As I sort of alluded to before, it, it is becoming increasingly harder to make money as a lawyer doing sort of lawyerly things. Uh, lawyers are uh, sort of being forced to charge less in certain spaces because clients are savvier than ever before. They're uh, looking to squeeze every last dollar out of their legal spend. Um, they have a lot more options potentially than they did previously. There's a lot more ways to find out about lawyers. So many attorneys open niche practices to sort of whittle down what it is that they do and, and to make it easier to market their practices and also from a malpractice avoidance standpoint um, because if you're doing the same thing all the time you're likely going to be better at it. But there are also lawyers out there who are adding additional businesses. Now traditionally this has been sort of your um, real estate closing attorney who then also has a real estate brokerage. But I've seen, I see people doing some interesting things. For example, there's a uh, lawyer out there who runs a, a business called Turntable Kitchen. His wife makes uh, uh, different food preparations and he makes mixed CDs basically. And they send them out and they sell them to people as packages. And he runs a law practice on the side. So there are new opportunities out there, especially in the internet age, for attorneys uh, to not just do legal work. And there are different marketing streams out there. Um, one of the challenges is uh, the difficulty in figuring out the marketing channels um, that you can use and sort of avoiding a mixed message I think is, is the biggest issue. Now there are some ethics rules in play here probably in your jurisdiction to uh, talk about how you can engage in, an alternative business model in addition to a legal practice but in addition to potentially making some more money doing something like this I think the other issue is it helps lawyers to avoid burnout. Um, Lawyers who are just lawyers um, sometimes reach a point where they're sort of maxed out with that kind of work. It's a difficult work. Um, it's thoughtful work. Um, a lot of lawyers, a lot of modern lawyers feel like they're not getting paid enough money to do that kind of work. So part of this is a lifestyle choice, of course. But if you feel sort of burnt out by the legal side of things, um, you can do some legal work or full-time legal work and also have another business to run on the side as well that may or may not relate to your practice. So those are five areas where I think law practice is sort of changing and will continue to change. And if you can sort of embrace these trends ahead of time and, and maybe you don't adopt them but maybe you're ready to adopt them when the time comes, when they're fleshed out again, it's going to be advantageous for you and you're going to be ahead of the game 
whereas other lawyers are going to be, be behind the curve and trying to catch up. 